Good morning, everyone. It is 10 o'clock. We are going to give a few more minutes. We have 19 people registered for today's webinar. Um, there is, uh, you should have an option, um, maybe you don't, maybe I didn't set this one up correctly, to unmute to ask questions. If you do not, there is a chat bubble um, up in the top right corner that you can use to interact with us and ask questions throughout today's webinar. Um, so we'll just give a few more minutes for people to join us, and then we'll go ahead and dive into our topic today of immigrant data entry. All right, it looks like we're up to 12 people and I haven't seen anyone um, in the waiting room. We will admit people as we go. Um, but today, I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing uh, immigrant data entry, um, what qualifies someone as an immigrant according to Title III, um, and how to enter that data into state synergy for reporting purposes. Um, so, um, once again, if you had, if you were not with us when we first announced, we do have a chat bubble up in the top right hand corner of your screen. You are welcome to use that to ask questions as we go. We will have an opportunity for Q&A at the end if you would like to save your questions until the very um, end. We will get to those as we go. We'll also have information about who to contact if you should have a question come up uh, after we end today's webinar. So thank you all for being here on this Monday, November 6, 2023. We are going to get started with our topic today. So the first thing that we really want to hit on is data collection as a team sport. This is not something that just a data specialist should be doing. Uh, you really need to have really strong relationships with families so that you get really good data from families as you're entering information, um, especially with this particular um, collection. You really want to have good relationships with families so that you can get what you need. Um, so that's a good starting spot starting point, you also want to really maintain strong lines of communication between your data collection team in your SAU and also your data reporting person. So you want to make sure that you have that connection so that everyone knows what the roles are. Um, so if someone identifies a student as an immigrant, um, then you need to know how to uh, relay that information up to the Department of Ed um, through your data specialist. So this is a really great opportunity to kind of reevaluate your connections in your district so you know who to contact. Uh, and then also this is an opportunity for us at the department to let you know who to ask questions from. There are different types of questions, data entry questions, and then um, identifying immigrants and supporting students who are immigrant students. Um, and those questions go to different people. So today we're also gonna go through kind of those lines of communications and how to ask questions and ask for support uh, from us if you should need it. All right, with that, Dan, would you like to get into the definition of an immigrant? Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so we wanted to give everyone a overview of what the statutory definition is of an immigrant student. Um, so immigrant uh, children and youth means an individual who meets all three of the following requirements. So they're aged three through 21. They were not born in any state and they have not been attending one or more schools in any one or more states for more than three full academic years. And so that, you know, th with um, that third piece, it doesn't necessarily have to be three consecutive years. Um, so, you know, we do have that note there that when determining if they meet condition C, the months in attendance don't need to be consecutive. And then for the above definition, um, state means um, the continental 50 states, or sorry, 48 continental states, and um, as well as the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and it's based on uh, ESEA statute under Title III.
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jane Armstrong, and I am the ESOL State Specialist at the DOE. Um, I've been in this role since August. And so one thing that uh, Dan and Allie and I spoke about was the intersection of immigrant status and the multilingual learner status. So we thought this Venn diagram would be a really great depiction to show that um, there really can be an overlap in terms of what it means to um, be flagged or have a non-permanent status of immigration. Um, and those were what Dan just articulated in that federal definition. And that can be a student who is not an active multilingual learner. Um, you can have an active multilingual learner through our process, which is uh, administering the language use survey, which should be administered to any child entering in our state for the very first time. And that language use survey then indicates whether or not there needs to be an administration of an English language proficiency screener. And then the, the results of that screener then, then um, denote whether that student would be receiving um, ELD, what we call English Language Development Services. So that process does not necessarily correspond to a student being flagged as an immigrant because we have many multilingual learners who are born in the United States. It's a large number of our multilingual students. So this graphic is to show that one doesn't necessarily mean the other, and yet the two can be overlapping. Um, so this gets back to what Ali said, which is this really intricate need for communication, because we have a lot of different people, depending on your district, of how students are enrolling and registering, questions that are being asked of families, and also the screening process for whether or not student qualifies to be a multilingual learner. So um, we also have at the bottom of the slide deck, and I'll put in the chat, the main multilingual identification and placement guidance document that's updated annually. I'll put that in the chat and it's a really great flow of what a student would would do and a family upon entering and kind of if this, then this. And I'll put that in the chat as well. All right, so we wanted to kind of go over you know, who in your district might be um, working on identifying these students. So we know that, you know, the registrar is the person who collects the information from students, um, and then they would kind of make that initial determination if the student meets the requirements. Uh, for some districts, they record that in their local um, SIS um, and or state synergy, and then you would have your data specialist go in and verify that the student meets the federal requirements. Um, and then making sure that the student is, in fact, reported into uh, the state synergy system. So when we're requesting information from families, um, so for the purpose of determining if a student meets the definition of an immigrant children and youth um, under Title III, you know, some things that you should be doing is, you know, only requesting information about a student's date of birth, uh, their place of birth, and then prior school enrollments. Um, things that you don't want to be doing um, and things that you're not, you shouldn't be asking about is a student, parent, or guardian, or a sponsor of citizenship, the immigration status of a student, and the date of entry into the United States. Um, so yeah, so the, the note that we have as well is, you know, the above information has no bearing on whether the student meets the definition of immigrant children and youth for Title III. Um, so that, yeah, so, you know, and we just don't want to discourage students and families from enrolling in schools. So when we're looking at gathering information, um, the school and or district should note in writing, um, you know, providing the information is not required. The requested information is only going to be used to determine eligibility for programs that provide enhanced instructional opportunities for immigrants, uh, children, youth. And then as far as determining potential for eligibility, the school and district um, should determine whether a student meets the first two criteria of the definition um, of immigrant, children, or youth. So that's, again, the age three through 21, and if the student uh, was born outside of the United States. And then in collecting the data, you know, the schools and or districts should pose the same question of all students, 
ensuring that information is not used to discriminate uh, against students in any way. So as far as requesting prior enrollment data, um, so only after determining that a student meets the age and place, uh, place of birth eligibility um, for immigrant status, should the school and or district then ask questions to determine the total cumulative number of months the student has attended schools in the United States. Um, and then as far as um, Title III goes and how that kind of factors into all of this, so the definition for immigrant does fall under Title III, but immigrant students don't necessarily um, qualify a district for Title III funding. There is a special subgrant under Title III, which is the Immigrant Children and Youth Subgrant, and this is um, given out each year to one SAU. Um, they're awarded these funds under Title III for having the largest significant increase of an immigrant uh, and immigrant students compared to the average of the previous two years. So when we say significant increase, it's defined as a 200 plus percent increase in students with an average of at least 10 immigrant students in the prior two years. And then funding can be awarded to um, an SAU even if they don't qualify for a general Title III allocation. And then the um, award itself is at least $20,000 annually at this point. All right, and so with all that being said, um, now we're going to get into the data entry portion of the, today's webinar. So what happens in the district is that once a student is determined to be eligible um, as an immigrant, they meet the definition of all three criteria. Um, that de de uh, determination is made uh, by whom whomever in the district um, has been deemed appropriate to make that determination. Could be your school administrative assistant, principals, uh, registrar, whoever it may be. Uh, that in information then is often entered into your local student information system, be it PowerSchool, Infinite Campus, uh, Web to School, whichever one it may be. Um, you would want to make sure that that data is tracked and recorded in your local system. Then you want to make sure that your data specialist is pulling the reports and uploading that data to State Synergy. State Synergy is your portal to get everything into the NEO data, um, NEO student reports, and that's how we then use that data to make determinations of changes. That's how Dan knows who to contact to ask questions about anything that he notices any significant changes with. Um, and so that's um, that's a really important step to making sure that the data gets into State Synergy so that we then can provide any additional supports to districts. There are two different ways that the data can be uploaded into, um, into Synergy. One of the ways is through the student personal upload. Uh, it is part of that. Your local system should be able to pull that report if your flag is in your local system. When you pull your student personal upload for the state from your local system, it should have that flag uh, included so that once you upload the personal upload into Synergy, that data is all there. Um, if it's not, you may want to reach out to your local pro, um, provider and make sure that the data uh, exchange is taking place accurately. Um, so always go in and verify that the data is in the student data portion. You can also go in and manually flag the students within Synergy on the student data screen. So in the student module, you have the demographics section and you have a, a flag. It's just a yes or no um, on the upload. And so it's just a checkmark box on the Synergy student module. Um, so you can see under student data, uh, our student information, you have alias, email, and US en entry date. Across from that, you have immigrant, and you just want to make sure that that box is checked. If you do an upload, you would want to make sure that that box is still checked for that student to make sure that everything has gone in correctly. Um, SAUs are responsible for maintaining the immigrant flag and removing the flag after a student has been enrolled for three years or uh, three or more years in a U.S. school. There were a few questions about this um, as we sent out notices to districts, and we did want to address those in today's webinar. Um, we there was a question about whether or not the state can maintain that information. It is specific in the language that districts and schools are responsible for maintaining the flag force 
um, immigrant. And uh, we also do not collect original school entry date. And where that date can be fluctuating, it doesn't have to be consecutive years, we can't maintain it for that purpose either. Um, so also, as Jane had mentioned, the uh, and a student who is multilingual does not necessarily mean that they are an immigrant student. Um, and so the flags are actually on two different um, two different uploads. So an ML upload has that US school entry date. Um, and not all students who are going to be immigrant students are going to have that flag because they don't require a multilingual upload. So we can't track that information within the system. Um, so it is something that districts will need to maintain um, locally. Um, it looks like we did have a question pop into the chat. Um, so I'll go into the, our question section. Um, so the, here is your contact information for anyone who um, has any questions um, after today. Once again, we do have the chat available and we'll get into some of the questions that have come in. Um, so uh, if you have questions about English, uh, link, English for speakers or other languages, um, our ESOL state specialist is Jane Armstrong. Uh, you can email her at jane.armstrong armstrong at maine.gov. Our Title III coordinator, Dan Weeks, is um, daniel.r.weeks at maine.gov. Uh, for reporting, if you're having any issues with any uploads, you're getting errors or anything like that, please email the Medems Help Desk or call 624-6896. Uh, um, and then if you would like any training in navigation of Synergy or NEO, uh, we also have training opportunities available for that. You can contact me at alexandra.cookson at maine.gov. Um, so one of the questions that we had come in, and I'm going to, um, I don't know who wants to take this question, but uh, what about foreign exchange students and tuition foreign students? Dan, do you want to take that one? Um, I have, actually have to look into that because, um, Ali, I'm not sure how those students are recorded in Synergy or in NEO. Um, so we might have to talk about that offline and get back to everyone about that one. Yeah, I know we do ask that they get enrolled um, and they get enrolled with like a private pay if they're paid for by their um, their company that's sponsoring them um, or however else. But um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't believe they count as immigrant, but I um, just will also have to check into it to be sure and give a 100 percent answer. Um, next question was, wasn't U.S. entry date a question that we're not to ask? Um, so U.S. entry date. Um, Dan, do you want to talk about how you can get the date of entry specific? Because we do have that on the upload. And so the question is, how do they get that without asking that question? So I think what we're really looking for is not necessarily the date of U.S. entry, which is why, you know, we look at the age and place of birth first. Um, and that way, you know, if they're born outside of the U.S., um, then that's why we kind of move into, well, how many years have they been, you know, enrolled in a school um, in the U.S.? So that kind of helps us uh, with those things. So asking for the date itself isn't really what we're looking for. Um, we can see or we can ask about, um, you know, when were they first enrolled in a school in Maine, I believe. Is that right, Allie? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we can ask that question, but we can't ask, you know, what their U.S. entry date was. And again, that that's kind of back to the point of asking for their place of birth. And so we kind of get around it without asking directly. Could they, um, just a question that I have, could they ask for their first date in a school in the United States? Because it is United States based, rather than their entry date, like when did you first set foot in the United States? Ask what was your first school enrollment when did your first school enrollment start in the united states yeah we can certainly get that information we can ask that information i think part of the issue is trying to verify some of that data mm. um and so at least if we have if we ask you know when was the first time enrolled in a main school we can actually verify that data because we would have that in the system um, so we can ask about other states but trying to verify that data isn't always um, as easy as it might sound Okay, yep. Um, and then we did have another question come in. When did this change and when will the uh, uh, when will you update the data dictionary? Because the indicator 
Um, the yes, no indicator is um, indicator that the student is an immigrant. Um, so that has always been, um, that, that will always remain the guidance that's in the data dictionary is did the quality, the, did the student qualify as an immigrant or not? Um, and there are, um, there are standards that do qualify a student as an immigrant or not, uh, just as all of our other yes, no indicators have qualifiers that make a student um, indicated as yes or no for any of those answers. Um, and so there are resources in the um, student enrollment guidance document or in the student enrollment guidance um, page that do have information about those background and background um, qualifiers that qualify a student as yes or no um, for all of the data dictionary elements that have an indicator that the student is like. Um, so we have added the uh, on the enrollment guidance page the um, qualifications that would help you identify that a student has can be qualified as an immigrant. Those have been added to that page. We also have another question about um, uh, Khmer is, isn't a language um, option in Synergy. What should we use instead? Um, I will need to get back to you about that one, Michelle, um, so that we can see what your options are for that um, and see if we can find the best fit for that um, in Synergy. Thank you for asking that though. I don't have any other questions, so we'll maybe give it a minute or two. And if we see people start to drop off, um, we will go ahead and end today's webinar. Um, and uh, once again, if you have any questions after today's webinar, want to reach out um, and uh, ask any questions about determination um, or data reporting, here are your contacts. Uh, we would be happy to answer your questions and give any assistance that we can. We want to make sure that the data is accurate. so. Um, we're happy to help with that so that we can get you all the support that you need. All right. I think we will go ahead and end today's webinar. Thank you all for joining us. Um, have a great rest of your Monday. Uh, we do not currently have any other webinars scheduled um, for the data team, but we will get some posted um, as soon as we do have some out there. So keep an eye on the webinars page and our newsletter. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.